Hey everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Anomaly number four, the only underground comic version of Anomaly. The first three issues were uh, science fiction fanzines, but um, the second and third issues uh, featured more and more comic book, comic story content. Vaughn Bodet contributed to the second issue, uh, Corbin to almost all the issues, and uh, in the second and third issue had comic, actual comic strips in there, mostly written by Jan Sternad. Anomaly was the brainchild of Jan Sternad. Uh, the fanzine issues uh, he co-published with one of his buddies. And this one I think is all Jan Sternad. And uh, very nice underground, uh, sci-fi underground. It's, um, well, you can't go wrong. It starts with a Richard Corbin cover, very whimsical piece by Corbin. Uh, this slave woman is grooming this dragon with a rake. Uh, he's got her on a leash. And, uh, well, I guess it's not whimsical if you're the slave woman, but it's, uh, for Corbin, it's, uh, kind of whimsical. Beautiful Corbin, you know. Just look at the colors and everything. He's so good. So here we have an inside uh, front cover by um, Robert Klein. Robert Klein is this uh, really great cartoonist. I don't have much of his stuff. He did tons of stuff for um, sci-fi fanzines and comic book fanzines. And did a few undergrounds here and there. But he did a lot of fanzine work over the years. And he's very accomplished. Um, just this classic great cartooning style. He, he could have drawn for the Sunday comic strips, I think, you know, back in their heyday. This is from 1972, by the way. So we start off the issue with a Richard Corbin solo piece, three pages, Alice in Wanderlust. Sorry, Wonderlust. And it starts just like the novel. She sees a rabbit running and she goes chasing him down the rabbit hole. But when she falls into the rabbit hole, when she gets down there, there's all these like psychotic, horny rabbits. They just look demented. And of course it's Richard Corbin art, so uh, Alice has got humongous breasts. And the rabbits chase her down and ravage her. And, but then she wakes up and says it was just a dream. But then the Cheshire cat, uh, who's on the tree branch next to her, fades away. And uh, we're left wondering if it really was a dream. Like a lot of stupid comic stories do that. But this is just fun to see great uh, Richard Corbin cartooning. So here we have Leander and the Fat Queen, written by Jan Sternad and illustrated by Robert Klein. And we see this character, Leander. He's in this kind of fairy tale world. Um, it's It's got this very wry sense of humor, though. Uh, Jan Sternad's narration and his, um, his captions and his word balloons. It's uh, definitely going for yucks. It's trying to be funny. So Leander's riding his bicycle through the desert. This rich merchant on his riding lizard walks by and the lizard pees all over Leander, drenches him. So Leander says, hey, you can't get away with that. I got my rights. And the merchant's very affable. He says, oh, I'll be perfectly glad to make amends. Let me give you a gift for an apology. <coughs> Excuse me. And he gives him this gold ring. So he puts it on, and as soon as he puts it on, he says, oh, I, I perhaps I should mention the curse, though, that goes along with the ring. And he can't get the ring off. And he informs him that uh, the only way the curse can be removed is uh, by marriage to Hepzibah, queen of the lost island of Grizz. And if he doesn't get rid of the curse, in a month's time, he'll become a lizard. And the lizard he's riding actually is a, a victim of the curse, a previous victim. That's nice cartooning. He's a really good artist. So he uh, he rides off, and Leander's like, "What the hell am I going to do now? I don't even know where this gri uh, island of Grizz is." So the moon starts talking to him, and uh, apparently they're old buddies. He's like, "Where was your advice when I needed it?" And so he tells him like how to get to Grizz. He gives him some uh, clues. He says, maybe you should get on a ship. And uh, he tells them all kind of, where's that? Oh yeah, 
He says he'll pull some strings for him to get him there too. So he makes it to a ship and books passage on it. And they're heading to Grizz. He's already turning into a lizard. It's only a week in. And uh, he's already changing. So I guess the moon sent uh, <laughs> the wind, his sibling, to uh, help out. And the wind is blowing at the sails to speed the journey along. But it's blowing so hard that Leander falls off the ship. And luckily, though, he gets rescued by this uh, porpoise, I believe. <laughs> and the porpoise is named Coleridge. And on the way there, he recites to him his new poem, Kublai Khan. So he drops him off at, uh, at the island. And uh, Leander's pretty happy with the way things are going. But then these insect soldiers conk him on the head, knock him out. And they hog tie him and they take him into these catacombs. And we see all these other uh, creatures of various sorts hog tied up. And one of them, one of the insects, just totally slits down the belly and lets all his entrails and blood come out. Almost like a kosher butcher. So he's tied up and he's like, oh shit, I'm next. So he has a hidden blade and he frees himself. And he stabs the guard who was left to guard him, the, the butcher. And he runs off to try and find the queen. And he finds her. And she, she's so, she's huge and so repulsive. It's, she looks like this big fat larva just spitty, spewing out a mountain, a hill, hillside of eggs. So he uh, goes up to the queen and he says... Hey, I want to marry, I want to marry you. And uh, he says, yeah, I, I want you to lift the curse. That's why I want to marry you. And she says, oh, that old ring is still around. Step forward, I'll, I'll remove it for you. Because she doesn't even want to marry him. So she just grabs his hand and bites his hand off with the ring on it. And he's like, damn it, I could have done that myself. All of this has been for nothing. And uh, the queen tells him, hey, you're part lizard. Maybe it'll grow back. So he's furious. So he just starts, he's going to fight his way out of there. He's going to kick his, as much ass as he can on the way out. So he's fighting all these guards. And uh, he reaches the end of his limit and he throws a spear at the queen and slices up a wound in her gut. And all of her eggs come out like an avalanche on kind of uh, smothering a bunch of the soldiers. The rest of the soldiers keep attacking him. He fights his way out and he makes it out of the catacombs, the cave. And uh, he waves down the porpoise who's still there and the porpoise takes him away into an uncertain future. Though he does vow that the one thing he's going to do is kill, kill that merchant that gave him the ring. Pretty funny stuff. Pretty fun. Here we have Richard Corbin, another solo piece by Corbin, Encounter at War. This is just a nice, you know, typical great Corbin sci-fi piece. So these two soldiers are, uh, they're in this area on Earth and they're looking for the last place their captain was seen. Their captains disappeared. And apparently there's a war going on where these aliens have invaded Earth for the for the past few years. They've been trying to conquer us, so we're you know we've been fighting them all this time. So everyone splits up to go look for the captain, and we just got this beautiful cinematic Corbin storytelling. And one of the enemy soldiers, the aliens, shoots him with a dart in his neck, and it knocks him out. So they take him to this thing. It's like a transporter. This is how the aliens have been coming to Earth to. Uh, battle us. They go through the the transporter, kind of like Star Trek, and it beams them back to their home planet. Yeah, this is some beautiful art. Corbin with his... I don't even know if that's airbrush or what the hell it is. It's hard to tell with Corbin. He, he's a master of so many techniques. So we're on this alien planet, all this crazy alien architecture and technology. I like this, how their language 
is depicted in the word balloons as some kind of pictographic uh, font. Uh, Corbin devised. Very interesting. So they're uh, taking him to his jail cell. I love this panel right here too. Like we have all this amazing airbrush. But then here, for the technology here we see, uh, Corbin just decides to just use just a total thin line, but shaded. It's just wonderful art. And it's just kind of throwaway. It's just the background. He could have totally fudged that, you know, not done that. But, you know, Corbin, just a master craftsman. So when he gets in the, he's in his jail cell. And in the adjoining jail, jail cell is this scary, badass lizard dude. And he attacks him. But then the guard zaps the lizard. He says, get back to your own cell, you know. And uh, th this guy looks over and he sees his captain, the one he's been looking for. He's been cap, you know, because he's been captured by the aliens too. And he tells him that uh, we got to hurry. The the gnomes that have been attacking our planet, that's what they call these aliens. The gnomes, uh, their planet has been attacked. So they're uh, bringing back all their soldiers from the Earth invasion because they need them to fight off this uh this home war. And he says, and when that happens, when the last troops are transported back, the, our only link with home will be severed. They're gonna shut down the transporter. So they gotta hurry. So they hear like the war above on the surface level, they hear explosions. So he breaks out of his jail cell, uh, beats up the guard and he shoots the, the lock mechanism that controls all the jail cell doors. So it releases all these random aliens, including the badass lizard. And they all start fighting the gnomes. So the captain and uh, our hero are uh, fighting their way through all these soldiers. And we see some great sci-fi art here of just the battle being waged. You know, spaceships being knocked out of the sky and aerial dogfights between the gnomes and their attackers. Just beautiful Corbin sci-fi shit, which he's so good at. So they fight their, war, fight their way all the way to the transponder or the transporter. And there's all these guards there. All these gnomes are there to protect it. So they gotta fight through every inch to get to the transporter. And more of them keep popping up, the returning soldiers from Earth. And the lizard guy shows up and helps him out. He's just like kicking ass. He's like the Incredible Hulk here, just grabbing him by the fistful and throwing him around. So the uh, he our hero, quote unquote hero, makes it to the door first. And he takes a bomb and throws it back right into the lizard's hands. Even though the lizard was helping him out, <laughs> he doesn't care. He just wants to get out of there and he's gonna take as many of the soldiers with him, even if it's his, uh, you know, his newfound friend. And right as the bomb explodes, the transporter zaps him back to Earth. But he totally was so scared and panicked, he left the captain behind. So he's back on Earth and his uh, colleague says, what happened to Captain Phillips? And he totally lies and says he's dead. And, uh, <laughs> but then we see Captain Phillips. He's just like, you bastard. You could have waited. I just want to point out, look how beautiful this face is here. The shading. Dad, Corbin is so amazing. I'm just in awe of this guy. He never ceases to amaze me. And then we, we see on the alien planet, this poor fucking captain. I mean, it's him against the whole planet. And he's got one little rifle left. So he figures he's just going to go out fighting. The, with the remaining bullets he's got left. He's fighting these soldiers and the camera just pulls back. And, you know, obviously that guy's not long for this planet. So just an amazing, like, t weird twist ending how this fucker just left his captain and die. Pretty bleak shit. We have an inside back cover here by uh, uh, Robert Klein. Again, being a, even more whimsical than that story. Not, not as well drawn, kind of silly. We see an ad here for Bud Plant, because Bud Plant actually, uh, the great distributor, uh, every now and then they would actually publish a comic that uh, he'd have a little surplus money and he'd make his own great comic. He sold lots of great comics, but every now and then he made them. 
and we have a nice back cover by Corbin. It looks like early Corbin. It's uh, not quite there. This alien's kind of goofy looking. Um, this looks like his late fanzine work. So I don't know if this is a reprint from uh, some old fanzine. It doesn't have a date on it. But I mean, still, like, it's amazing. It's better than 99% of most art. Even like back then, his craft is outstanding. These mesas and plateaus and mountaintops, just photorealistically, beautifully airbrushed and shaded. It, it just looks amazing. But still, the composition, he was much better at composition later on and, and just pure drawing, you know. So that's it, Anomaly number four. Great sci-fi underground. And uh, I recommend you buy it and put it in your collection. Toot sweet. So uh, that's it for this episode of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies.